here at the firm. And today we're going to spend some time discussing a little bit about, you know, when and whether you should speak to an attorney regarding your federal employment matter. You can go to the next slide, Taylor. So what, here's sort of our roadmap and our plan of attack for today. Um, so what we hope that you're going to learn by the end of this is that, you know, what's going to happen when you have a legal consultation, what you as the potential client should prepare um, in whether or not you're discussing discrimination, proposed disciplinary actions, or other matters related to federal employment. Um, one of the reasons why, you know, you may be seeking to hire an attorney and why it's important not to wait until the last minute and the just overall benefits of having a consultation and potentially hiring an attorney. Next slide, please. So let's start off first by talking about what actually happens during a consultation. Now, consultations are a little bit like snowflakes. They're not all going to be exactly the same. Um, they're going to be unique. But in general, uh, most times you can expect some of the following things to happen during a consultation. You're always going to start usually with discussing why you're calling, what the you know, facts are of your particular matter. And then the uh, attorney is going to help you to potentially identify defenses that the other side may have, you know, reviewing, you know, if there are documents in the matter, discussing potential strategy, also discussing kind of the way ahead, the life cycle of the case and what could happen, possible outcomes. And with that reviewing you know, based on, you know, the current status of the case, what are strengths and weaknesses in whatever your claim may be. And then regardless of whether or not you're going to retain counsel, in most consultations, regardless of whether or not you're going to wind up becoming a client, the consultation attorney can discuss, you know, just general legal advice for you to take forward, even if pursuing the matter on your own or with somebody else. Next slide, please. So I think it's important to talk about a couple of the main areas in which um, frequently we hear consultations on. So federal employment EEO is a very common topic area. So it's beneficial to talk a little bit about the process. Um, and then what things may be relevant to why you may be seeking a consultation or what things you could learn um, as a result of that consultation. So EEO complaints are um, when you're alleging that something that is occurring in your job or some conduct that's occurring by your employer is based on a protected basis. So you're alleging discrimination, hostile work environment, harassment based on race, national origin, color, age over 40, disability, religion, previous EEO activity, and a few other um, protected bases, but those tend to be the most common. Now, when you first file an EEO complaint, you're always filing what we call an informal complaint. Informal doesn't mean that it's not serious or that um, nothing is happening with it, every federal employment EEO case starts off with an informal complaint. And in that, you're going to be alleging the bases for discrimination, what are the different discriminatory acts, actions, or conduct that have occurred, and when did they take place. Now, in terms of a consultation, what's important to know is, first of all, you're always going to have to be seeking out filing within 45 days of whatever the issue is. So that's why it's often very important that if you believe that you are facing some sort of discriminatory conduct or action, that you get advice early in the process because time can be a huge issue. And sometimes if you wait too long, you may no longer have the ability to file because that 45 days is a very strict deadline. Now, during the process of a consultation, you'll also learn about the different 
types of informal complaint that you could have. You can either go through what they call traditional counseling or you can go through mediation. Having counsel through either of these processes can be very beneficial because they can help to um, help you identify, you know, number one, what types of claims that you may be wanting to make, and also whether or not you want to engage in that traditional counseling or mediation process. And then if you move forward and actually have representation, your counsel can be in the role of negotiator on your behalf during that process. There's also, after the informal, if the matter doesn't resolve, you're going to get what they call a notice of right to file a formal complaint. And once you receive that, you have 15 days to then file that formal complaint. So if you're having a consultation, often you're going to get questions about where you are in the process. Have you received that? When did you receive it? You know, have you actually filed? Because if you miss that deadline, that could also be something that would lead to the dismissal of your case by not file, filing timely. Something else that can occur during the formal complaint process, after you file, the process is going to then include an investigation where you're going to be interviewed, other parties are going to in, be interviewed, and they're going to create a report, and that's called a report of investigation. There also may be additional things that happen during you know, that time frame in terms of additional discrimination or retaliation that you might feel are going on. And that's something that you might want to discuss with an attorney if you're not already represented, because those things may need to now be included in your complaint as an amendment to include now new bases of or reasons that you're alleging discrimination. After the formal complaint has been processed, like I said before, they're ultimately going to be doing an investigation. At the, at the end of that investigation, a report is prepared, and they have 180 days to do that. Well, at that point, when you then get a copy of that investigation, you're then able to make a decision as to whether or not you want the agency to make a decision on whether or not discrimination has been substantiated. That's called a FAD, or final agency determination, or you can elect to go to the EEOC and have a hearing in front of an administrative judge. This can be another time that talking to counsel, if you haven't already, can be beneficial in weighing out your options on whether or not you want to ask for the agency to make the decision or whether or not you want to elect to go and have a hearing before a judge. If you do make that election to have a hearing before a judge, um, and you otherwise have not had counsel up to that point, that can be another time when you would want to talk to an attorney because once the judge is assigned, you're going to start to have additional obligations from the administrative hearing process in terms of engaging in what they call discovery. There may be motions that you would have to respond to and ultimately a hearing that you would have to present evidence at. And that is often things that can be very complicated and may require, if not attorney representation, certainly attorney advice so that you can get an idea of what is expected of you, what's the best strategies, and how to move forward. Also, if you do either ask for a final agency determination or your case goes to the EEOC for a hearing, there could be a decision issued. And with that decision, you could ultimately have um, a disagreement with it that would then require an appeal. And that's an appeal to what they call the Office of Federal Operations or OFO. That's another area where having a consultation with an attorney can be very beneficial to determine, number one, what your potential strategy would be in that appeal, um, what your deadlines and timelines would be associated with that. And they tend to be very quick. So from the time that you get the decision, to the time that you have to file your OFO appeal or at least notice of it is usually a 30-day turnaround. So that's something that you would want to talk to an attorney about pretty quickly to decide whether or not it would be in your interest to file that appeal and whether or not having representation to do so would be beneficial and your be in your best interest. Next slide, please. Now, when you're having a consultation on an EEO matter, 
the things that can best prepare you for the most successful EEO consultation are often going to be in terms of the preparation that you put into beforehand. So, you know, ultimately the consultation is a discussion, but it's a led discussion where you want to make sure you're not wasting your own time by, you know, not talking about the issues that you want to discuss. So it's very important that you know the different bases that you're trying to allege and what the dates are of the specific discriminatory acts. Because like I said earlier, dates are very important. If you were complaining about something that happened, you know, several months ago, um, and you want to file an EEO complaint, you may be what we call time barred, because if it's more than 45 days ago, you may not be able to file. So it's important for you to sit down and really think about when things have happened, you know, what things have happened, and why you believe that they've happened, so that you can best discuss that with the attorney. And it can be very beneficial for you to prepare a narrative or an outline for yourself, and even share that with the attorney that you're consulting with so that you can keep yourself on topic, keep yourself, you know, on the, the right pathway and to help yourself to be able to communicate with the attorney. Now, the narrative, though, never replaces the discussion that you're going to have with the attorney. It really should be more of a roadmap for both you and the attorney because having that discussion, even if you've written, you know, a 10 page narrative where you lay everything out, you're going to want to communicate with the attorney for a couple different reasons. Number one, the, you have to get used to telling what your story is, because if the case does move forward, you will often be the primary witness on your behalf. So getting used to communicating about the discrimination and the different events is, a good, is good practice to make sure that you know you have that opportunity and learn to best communicate you know what's happened to you because you're going to have to do it sometimes multiple times during this process also often things get kind of lost in translation when you're just reading a document so it's good to have that dialogue with the attorney because the attorney is probably going to have follow-up questions that may not be addressed just in your narrative alone if you have any specific documents, especially if the case has gotten into the administrative hearing stage at the EEOC, you're going to want to make sure that you have all the different orders that the judge has sent, any of the documents, and send those to the attorney ahead of time, because that's going to help in the discussion so that you can really be on the same page when you're discussing the different issues. And always, whenever you're having a consultation, make sure that you're on time, you're in a place where you have the ability to communicate, you know, confidentially without people overhearing, you know, usually quiet, good access to, you know, if you're in an area where your phone consistently drops out, that's probably not where you want to be. And, you know, you obviously want to already always be on time. Next slide. Another big topic area that we frequently have discussions about are sort of what we would call proposed disciplinary actions. And that can be a couple different areas. It can start off with, you know, you're called in to potentially be interviewed on a topic. That can be an area where you might want to talk to an attorney before that occurs, or even if you know that an investigation might be starting, even though you have not necessarily been contacted for an interview, that's an, a time when it can be beneficial to reach out to an attorney to talk about, you know, what your rights may be, you know, how best to um, handle questions by the investigator, and whether or not having legal representation at that stage could help you um, to even potentially prevent future discipline. Now, what that means is often, you know, when you're first starting an investigation or an investigation has been started and you're a potential subject, there's no decision that's been made at that point. So you often have the best opportunity to have the most favorable result before any findings as a result of an investigation have been made. So having an attorney early in the process to help guide you and even shape the process 
can ultimately affect the end result in a much better way than waiting around to see what happens and then potentially having to then rebut uh, an unfavorable investigation or then respond to the proposed disciplinary action. However, sometimes that's what happens is people don't recognize that they really are facing something until they actually get the notice. And that's another time that it's very beneficial to talk to an attorney is when you receive the notice of proposed discipline. And the types of things that we're talking about are usually either letters of reprimand, suspensions, demotions of a pay grade, removals. Um, now, with those, there's going to be a built-in time structure, but it's usually a pretty fast turnaround. You're usually talking about anywhere from 7 to 14 days that you're going to have to be able to respond to those proposals. So that's a time that you want to make sure from the moment you get it that you're reaching out to have that discussion you know, with somebody who can give you advice on the process and potentially even represent you in preparing that response. Now, if though that has all happened and you've received the discipline, there's also often the opportunity to appeal after you receive it, depending on what the nature of the discipline is. Letters of reprimand often have the least amount of uh, appeals process. You're usually talking about um, a grievance or um, if you believe that the reason behind why you've received the letter of reprimand is either because of some discrimination or retaliation, you may have options in either the EEO process that we just discussed or something we're going to discuss in a couple minutes, what we call the OSC, the Office of Special Counsel, to file a complaint regarding reprisal or prohibited personnel practices. But the deadlines for those things are often very tight. So if you have received a adverse finding after a proposal and you've not talked to counsel before, you're going to want to reach out very quickly to discuss what your options are for purposes of appeal um, and then, you know, then the process thereafter. Because with some types of disciplinary actions, so suspensions that are over 14 days, demotions of a pay grade, removals, you may have the right to go to what they call the Merit Systems Protection Board and you know, having counsel advise you about those options and then what that process is like to include you know, the process of addressing the administrative judge, going through discovery, the hearing, and then potentially appeals are all things that counsel you know, can be very beneficial in discussing what your options, rights, and the process are. Next slide, please. So as we talked about with the EEO process, you know, the way in which you can help yourself to have the most successful consultation regarding a proposed disciplinary action or investigation is, especially if you're talking about an actual proposed disciplinary action, make sure you send that letter um, before the consultation to the, the attorneys so that they can review it and be able to review it with you during the discussion, because often the strategy that's going to go into these are going to be very factually specific. So knowing exactly the allegations that have been made against you, you know, can change the advice that your attorney is going to give you. Plus, that document's going to have a lot about what your timelines are, what your rights are in terms of appeal, who the matter should be addressed to. So those are all things that it's very beneficial for the attorney to actually review with you so they can make sure that you have the most accurate advice. Much like with the EEO process, doing a narrative about the different circumstances related to maybe the events or the conduct or the performance um, issues that are alleged in the proposed action can be important. But again, not a replacement for having the discussion with the attorney, but a way to kind of outline what issues that you believe are important. Also, a good idea to think about like the strategy of the response. So are there potentially witnesses that would be beneficial or different um, what we call comparator situations? So somebody maybe who had received a disciplinary action for conduct that was similar, but maybe it was much less severe 
that would be something that you would want to try and think about to discuss with the attorney because that would be part of the strategy and the response and part of the tools that you would use as part of your defense extenuation mitigation for that issue. And like I said before, you always want to be on time, be ready to discuss the issues and have, you know, a clear direction on what you're seeking assistance with. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so we talked about this just briefly a second ago. Um, Office of Special Counsel or OSC is another topic that we often hear about, although sometimes you may not specifically say that I want to file an OSC complaint, but what you're talking about is you believe that you're being retaliated against or treated unfavorably because maybe you complained about a violation of a rule or regulation or gross mismanagement or waste of funds or abuse of authority or substantial health and safety um, violations. That's commonly what we call whistleblowing. Or maybe you just filed a, a complaint or a grievance or an appeal to something um, within your organization and believe that you're now being retaliated against because of that. Or other types of maybe more um, general um, discrimination not based on protected bases or um, different uh, illegal hiring actions or um, things like uh, violation of uh, different preferences those all may fall under what we call prohibited personnel practices. And that is the purview of the Office of Special Counsel if you have the ability to file there. Not all federal agencies um, and employees have the ability to file. So that's something that you would potentially want to talk to an attorney about is what rights do you have if you believe that you are, in fact, a whistleblower who's being retaliated against or subjected to prohibited personnel practices, what can you do in order to try and address those and what the process is? If you do have the ability to go to the Office of Special Counsel, you know, it can be beneficial to talk to an attorney and even have attorney representation in putting together your complaint and then helping you through the investigation and negotiating with the agency to try and come to a resolution. Also, if you are alleging reprisal for protected activity or whistleblowing, if the Office of Special Counsel cannot come to a resolution, they can give you what's called an individual right of action that allows you to go to the Merit Systems Protection Board to file an appeal. There's timelines associated with that, and that's something that often you would want to talk to an attorney about um, in terms of whether or not you would be entitled to that what your rights are, whether or not, you know, it makes sense for you to do that, and what the pros and cons and ultimate strategy should be if you're going to pursue that. And then, of course, always the timelines associated with it. Next slide, please. Now, in terms of other areas, now, this is not obviously a, a you know, an entirely exclusive list. There's all sorts of issues that can come up in federal employment, but there are some uh, common ones that we hear quite frequently. Disability retirement is um, an area um, along with um, seeking reasonable accommodations for disabilities. Um, it can be very important, even though your agency is supposed to assist you with the accommodations process and the disability retirement application process, you often can receive you know, incomplete and sometimes even inaccurate advice from your agencies. So it can be beneficial to talk to an attorney um, through an, a consultation to determine, do you meet the criteria? What is the process to apply? You know, what does OPM consider in you know, making that decision? And then if you've applied, you may receive a denial and you have the ability to seek reconsideration, and it may be at that point beneficial to talk to an attorney to have help with it, because the um, process by which OPM reviews is very hypercritical. So often you can meet the criteria, but just because you haven't phrased it and provided the information that they're specifically looking for, you can be denied. But having counsel 
ultimately direct you and represent you in the process can often help take away some of that confusion. And because obviously we have a lot of experience in preparing these matters, we know what to look for and what OPM is looking for. Now, if you are not a member of a union and have a collective bargaining agreement, you're not going to have what they call the negotiated grievance procedure. However, most agencies have a form of grievance called an administrative grievance that could often be the route where you may be taking an appeal of say like a letter of reprimand or a suspension that's under um, 15 days um, where you're addressing kind of the legalities and the problems associated with that. Um, usually, if you have a negotiated grievance um, procedure, your union can assist you with the process, but where it's an administrative, you're not going to have that benefit of having union representation. Um, it's important here, if you are considering grieving or you have a complaint about some action that's occurred, that you talk to counsel quickly because the timeline related to grievances can be as short as 15 days. So it's a good idea. And also there can be some complications in what things actually are grievable and what may have to go through some other method. So it's a benefit to talk to an attorney about what your best strategy would be. Um, desk audits are often another area, although again, people don't often call specifically about desk audits. The common issue is people believe that they are performing duties um, beyond what their you know, position description requires and or their pay grade would support. And they're seeking to either have changes to their position description, but more often they're seeking to increase their grade level. Um, and there's a process by which you can seek to do this. Um, it's usually first best to address that through your agency um, and um, seek to have them reconsider the, the current classification of your position. Um, but it can ultimately wind up going to OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, for a process as well to evaluate that. But that can be very complicated and having counsel advise you can be very beneficial to talk about the things that you may need to present or even have a representation to do that on your behalf. Um, debt issues are also something that people often don't think about as a federal employment issue, but they can be. Um, the, you know, often you can receive issues in terms of maybe you were um, erroneously overpaid. Um, this happens a lot of times also in retirement issues where you may have um, receive funds that, that they're now saying you weren't entitled to and now they're assessing a debt, there's a process by which you can seek to challenge that either through an actual dispute or what they call request for review or alternatively if the debt is in fact valid but you believe that you know there are circumstances that warrant it being waived, you can seek to, to do that. Doing this relatively soon um, can be very beneficial. In fact, you usually want to assert either a dispute or a waiver within 30 days of when you first receive that notification of debt to get all your potential benefits to include maybe even having them stay collection of it while the adjudication of the debt is pending. But this can be a complicated process, especially because um, there are a lot of decisions that are made um, usually by the comptroller, um, and other um, entities that you as an individual may not have access to, but an attorney would, and that can be very helpful in presenting your rationale for why you're either disputing or seeking waiver. So talking to an attorney about this and even having an attorney represent you for your debt dispute can be very beneficial, or at least helping guide you to where, what things may be good arguments going forward. Next slide, please. So some bad habits to try and avoid. Um, now, sometimes, whether it's because information is embarrassing or you think it might make you look bad or you think it may make the case bad, it's never a good idea to withhold any information when you're talking to your consultation attorney. Details may, like I said, be embarrassing or hard to discuss, but it's very important for the attorney to know 
And you have confidentiality with the attorney. So the attorney is not going to share those details. But by you failing to disclose information, you could ultimately not be getting the benefit out of that consultation because you're not getting the opportunity for that attorney to understand the full scope of the issue and give advice because the law is very factually specific. Um, a couple changes in the facts could ultimately change the opinion or the result. So never a good idea to hold things back, even if you think that they may, quote unquote, hurt the case. Um, in preparation for the consultation, we usually ask that people send documents, but you shouldn't send hundreds of pages. You really should try and only um, tailor those things to the things that are most important because you want the things that the attorney, um, you know, can have the opportunity to really review and discuss with you during the consultation. Um, an example is during the EEO process, there is that report of investigation that we talked about. That can be sometimes several hundred, if not thousands of pages. It's usually not a great idea to send that for purposes of the consultation because it's too dense to be able to really discuss. What is often beneficial is to send maybe the formal complaint or to you know, ultimately send the document where you have a deadline associated with it or orders from the court, because those are the things that are going to be very important and that can be actually discussed and that can actually help the attorney give you the way ahead. Now, sometimes in uh, these consultations, the attorney is going to give you information that you may not like to hear because it may be that you that the facts do not seem to support the action but it's not a good idea to just discount or you know not listen to the attorney's perspective because what we're trying to do as attorneys during a consultation is provide you with the view that the opposing counsel may have or the judge or the deciding official so that you understand both the pros and the cons of your case. So to sort of dismiss, you know, what seem like negative points, you know, are often going to be, you know, to your disadvantage because you're not hearing what another perspective could be. Next slide, please. So in terms of when you should seek out an attorney, now, you know, sometimes things are going to be clearer than other times. You're going to have a document that's a proposed removal. That obviously has a specific deadline. You know what that deadline is, so you have an immediate need. However, sometimes it can just be an issue where you're not really sure what's going on. It's often beneficial to en engage an attorney, at least for a consultation, as early as you see an issue forming. And why that is, is because you're trying to sometimes head off what could be a much larger issue down the road. And there may be issues that you don't even realize that might be starting a, a time clock that if you don't take action soon, you may ultimately waive the ability to do so. But of course, like I said before, upon receipt of any type of notice, so if you're getting a proposed discipline, if you've received a decision, if you received an order, you want to try and schedule a consultation as quickly as possible because the time is usually ticking. In terms of an EEO, if you've experienced some type of action that you believe is discriminatory, the closer in time to that event that you can identify um, should be when you try and talk to an attorney about it if you're considering pursuing some type of complaint, because as we talked about before, the timeline for filing an EEO complaint is only 45 days. So the sooner the better. It's also important to, to take action sooner rather than later. Say you had something that had a deadline of 60 days. It's never a good idea to wait to the 50th day or certainly the 59th day, because mistakes can happen. Issues can happen with technology where, you know, you don't want to be in a position that things beyond your control now make it so your deadline has lapsed um, or you don't now have enough time to be able to provide the best response. So earlier, the better. Next slide, please.
Now, when it comes to hiring an attorney, you know, the benefits of having counsel are numerous. I mean, probably, you know, the the primary reason that people seek out representation or even seek consultation is about the subject matter, is just her trying to understand. But there's also the issue of, I call it the two Ps, um, perspective and perception. Agencies often are not going to negotiate with you in the best faith. They are often looking at not just the facts, but their opponent. So having an attorney can often try and balance out the power dynamics. You know, give you a little step up so the agency sees you as more of a risk. Um, and there can often be the opportunity to try and resolve things earlier in the process where the agency sees more risk associated with it. So having counsel in that process can be very beneficial. The other aspect, too, is about having some level of your own perspective. It can be very difficult when you're trying to represent yourself in seeing things objectively. There's the old sort of joke that's made about the person who has um, themselves as a, you know, as a lawyer, you know, has a fool for a client, you know, and we all sort of ha laugh and joke about that. But the real truth of it isn't so much about just, it's an oversimplification. The reason that you're at a disadvantage when you're representing yourself is you, you know the facts from your perspective, but the people who are often in the decision-making position, they don't know the facts from your perspective. And sometimes, even though it may be true, it may not seem to be the most persuasive aspect of a case. So having an attorney can be beneficial to help you best argue and make the most persuasive arguments to that official as opposed to just trying to rely on what you know to be the truth that you may not be able to prove in the best way. So that can be an issue. And also there can be the perception of the other side. You know, you representing yourself, even though you may have, you know, some very good facts, they may not take it as seriously coming from you as opposed to having somebody who actually, you know, practices in that area of law. Also, as we were talking about before, there's a lot of very dense subject matter to include things about timelines and burdens that you often need to have some direction from an attorney to assist you with making sure that you're meeting those obligations of whether it's an administrative procedure or a court, um, navigating the deadlines, understanding you know what the burdens would be and how best to argue those and that's often something that's very difficult because your job isn't you know representing yourself as an attorney you have a full-time job in most of these instances so to try and do that and maintain you know whatever's going on in both your personal and professional life can often be too much to bear um, and also even trying to learn all those things can be very complicated and may not really hit the best practices that an attorney who has experience doing federal employment could bring to bear. Next slide, please. So this is our contact information. So if you decided that you had an issue that you did want to seek out consultation, you can obviously reach out um, telephonically, reach out through email. We also have an online um, process. Um, also, you know, obviously, you know, there can be issues that come up at, at any point, so you can always take that opportunity to, you know, reach out through any of these mechanisms. Next slide. This is the last side, Heather. Okay. Um, so do we, uh, I know that we were some, some of the questions that were sent ahead of time seem to have been more factually specific or were sort of more ge generalized questions regarding costs of things. Those are things that you're going to want to talk directly um, to an attorney about, you know, book a consultation to discuss because it's going to be dependent on the specific factual. So I don't think it would be really appropriate to discuss that in an open forum. 
but if there are any other questions based on what we talked about, you can submit them through Taylor here and we can address them here in our, in our last 10 minutes. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please submit them in the chat or the Q&A section and I will send them over. So one of the questions I just received is, what is the difference between an attorney and a counselor? Well, I mean, in general, um, a counselor can be a more broad term. It may not be somebody who was actually licensed to practice law. Um, it could be, you know, somebody who works in mental health. Um, but when you are talking to an attorney, attorneys are often, you know, go by many names. They could go by lawyer. Uh, attorney, counselor, but it's usually counselor at law at that point because they have a uh, a law degree and are admitted to practice law in a jurisdiction. But in general, um, counselor tends to be a more broad term that also involves people who are not admitted to practice law. Um, a question we received here is, do I need to file an EEOC before contacting attorney? No, you could talk to an attorney first about whether or not, you know, what you're talking about would be um, an EEO complaint or even have counsel assist you in preparing the claim to file. Um, this is a, a, a question regarding charges associated with it. That would require um, discussion of the individual um, matter because charges are not, you know, equal in every type of case. So that would be something you would want to reach out to talk about what your specific issue is and what the potential costs associated with pursuing that would be. Um, a question about sort of the, the area um, of the country. Um, should I seek a consultation with an attorney in the state of the company or should I seek a consultation with an attorney in my home state? Um, the issue is more about who employs you um, if you're talking about, like, this is a, a webinar regarding specifically federal employment. Federal employment, if you're having issues with your federal employer, it won't matter where your attorney is assigned for most things. You would want to just talk to a law firm that, a, that specializes, like us, in federal employment law. However, if you are not employed by the federal government, if you are employed by a private company, you often are going to want to talk to an attorney who has private employment experience in that jurisdiction because there's going to be state-specific rules and process that are going to control your issue. But that's also something that you can reach out um, and um, in booking a consultation explain your issues and then the, the um, process should explain whether or not that's something that that specific firm could assist you with. This is a specific question about um, work restrictions and non-compliance and whether or not that could be an EEOC. It could be. It obviously would depend on the facts. Um, this is a very specific question about comparator data. That would be, again, something that you would need to discuss with an attorney during a consultation and actually probably would not be able to be specifically addressed during a consultation. It's something that you know, you would often need, because there's not a, a specific answer regarding to how much evidence is going to convince a judge or not. It's, you know, judges are human beings, you know. It's often just about trying to present the most information that you have and, you know, making the argument in front of the judge. There's not a sort of quantitative number of different exhibits or witnesses that equal, you know, a favorable result versus a non-favorable result. Um, is there a particular type of case that would better would serve better filed in the Office of Special Counsel versus the EEOC? Well, they're addressing different things. Um, Office of Special Counsel is a just is addressing um, prohibited personnel practices and reprisal for whistleblowing, um, disclosures of whistleblowing, retaliation for protected activity. EEO is addressing discrimination based on race, national origin, color, sex, sexual orientation, disability, age, religion, previous EEO activities. So sometimes there are going to be overlaps where you may file with both. 
Other times you're gonna, it's gonna be dependent on what you're alleging. If you're alleging that, hey, I'm being discriminated against because of my gender, then you would file that with the EEO. Whereas if you're alleging, I believe I'm being retaliated against because I filed a grievance against my boss last year, then that would probably be better framed as an OSC complaint because you're not alleging discrimination. You're alleging retaliation for engaging in a protected activity. Um, this is asking, does an attorney represent you during ADR? If you decide that you want to retain counsel and have a, an attorney represent you, then an attorney could represent you during ADR. You're not provided counsel. You can seek out representation and then an attorney can represent you during ADR, which is also commonly known more as mediation in the EEOC process. I have a very specific question about how do you show um, a nexus between protected classes and a discriminatory incident. That's not something I can answer during a consultation. That's something that's going to be based on the facts of that individual's case. Well, I think that that's the last question we have. Um, like I said before, a lot of the issues that, you know, some very good questions that came in, but some also very specific questions, and that's probably the exact reason why you often would want to reach out and you know, talk to an attorney because, like I said before, facts matter. You know, the law isn't in a vacuum. It's not, you know, in every situation X happens. Depending on the who, the what, the where, the why, that can dramatically affect, you know, what could happen, what your rights are, what your obligations are. So those are the times that, you know, if you believe something wrong is happening or something has been alleged against you and you, um, are not sure what to do, having a conversation with an attorney is often beneficial. And why it's more than anything else, it's not just about getting advice, it's getting advice from somebody who doesn't have sort of a dog in the fight or, you know, an investment in the process up to this point. It's getting somebody who is hearing your facts, who isn't the agency itself. Because a lot of the people who you will talk to, whether it's in EEO or, being proposed for some sort of disciplinary action and talking to HR, those are all people who work for your agency. So their advice is always somewhat compromised because they think on behalf of the agency's perspective, not on yours. So it's a good idea to try and get a little bit of an arm's length in the advice that you receive so that you can make sure that people are more looking out for your interests and seeing things more objectively than just taking whatever you know, HR or EEO tells you it's a good idea to try and just get, you know, some kind of like a second opinion, you know, getting a little bit more information about a scenario. And you know, like I said before, you have our contact information. So if any of you have some specific issues and you want to seek out um, an individual consultation, you can reach out and we can arrange that. Thank you, everyone, again, for joining today's presentation. And thank you, Heather, for presenting. Um, a, copy, a, a copy of the presentation, um, the slides, as well as recording will be sent to all attendees in the next couple of days, so be on the lookout. I hope everyone has a good rest of their day. Bye, everyone.